let me just say a big thank you to WIDA for making the whole event possible and for existing. Um, I'm, I titled this uh, International Financial Systems rather than the International Financial System, and um, you'll see why in a moment. Um, I'm really structuring uh, my uh, talk around a broad question, you know, that is, uh, why have uh, international financial system reforms failed? As Valpi uh, quite rightly said at the beginning, um, we've had several major attempts at uh, um, reforming the international financial architecture, and, and none of them has really succeeded. The most ambitious were after the 1997 Asian crisis and after the 2008 uh, crisis, um, but uh, none, none has really succeeded. Um, that's the broad question. Um, the answer that I give, basically, is that um, uh, reform attempts are bound to fail. Major reform attempts are bound to fail. Um, and I put that, I'm putting that hypothesis forward really as something uh, derived from the endogeneity um, within uh, the financial system itself or within the financial systems. Um, in other words, I'm not talking about the inevitability of failure because of vested interests or national interests or uh, political lobbying and so on, although, of course, all those things are terribly important. Um, uh, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that there's a, there are endogenous forces uh, within the financial system that we can understand as economists um, that uh, uh, are bound to lead us to be disappointed with uh, reform plans. I really base that upon four propositions. Uh, the first is that the, interna the international financial system uh, actually comprises two distinct international financial systems. The second is that the evolution of those two international financial systems drives and is driven by crises. Crises are central to its evol evolution. The, th the third is that our standard toolkits um, uh, as economists, our standard theoretical toolkits, our standard models that enable us to, uh, I want to go back a bit, uh, that our, our standard toolkits um, actually uh, omit one major element, um, or, or they downplay at least one major element of the existing international financial system. Uh, and uh, the consequence of those three propositions is the fourth one, that reform plans are always backward-looking. Let me just expand on, on those. Um, starting the first proposition, there are two international financial systems bundled into one. Um, uh, I'll call them IFS1, IFS2, and IFS1 is what uh, I would define as international financial architecture. Um, that comprises uh, institutions like the IMF, central banks, the Basel Committee on Supervision, um, the Paris Club, the London Club, uh, regulatory bodies of various kinds. The second, uh, IFS2, is, if you like, the private sector. But uh, I wouldn't, uh, that's not an adequate description. So it includes agents, institutions like banks, non-bank financial firms such as hedge funds, uh, pension funds, um, and various markets, forex markets, fixed income markets, equity markets, and even the treasuries as a particular agent, the treasuries of non-financial firms, multinational corporations are themselves highly financialized. It's uh, um, difficult to distinguish them from, from uh, banks or, or shadow banks in some ways. Um, okay, the second, so I just want to keep those, those two distinct elements of the international financial system in our minds. Um, and I'm going to argue that our reform attempts really focus upon, always focus upon the international financial architecture, IMF, etc. Um, but there are forces within the um, you know, markets and banks sector that uh, uh, make those reform attempts um, uh, inevitably fail. Um, just as a uh, and moreover, those forces are such that they 
um, uh, both drive crises and are driven, the changes are both drive crises and are driven by crises. Okay, so the, the reforms of the, inter of the international financial architecture, the IMF, etc., are always driven by crises. Um, I don't have time to go through the list, but you're familiar with it all. Um, the second is that uh, those crises are inherent in the system because they're generated by the very nature um, of the uh, uh, dynamic nature of um, the, if you like, private part of the international financial system, IFS2. Um, the system of banks and markets, by its nature, has a dynamic which has three characteristics. It can only exist through continual innovation. Um, that innovation involves a continual uh, cycle of overexpansion. Um, an overexpansion driven by such things as what we call nowadays you know, search for yield um, or um, uh, over exuberance. Um, and um, uh, with any, by, by the very definition of over expansion, that means that um, uh, it's punctuated by crises. Uh, and we're talking about the importance of crises because for all crises, all crises um, uh, involve great um, setbacks for developing countries, even if they don't originate in developing countries. Um, crises occur when the overexpansion is brought to a halt by um, uh, a concentration upon unanimity, you know, a single minded view of what's happening to markets, single minded view of where your investments should be going, um, or what kinds of transactions you should be doing, or what kinds of financial products you should be developing. Um, and uh, we know that. Um, uh, uh, bankers are not good at making those judgments, um, and, um, uh, and uh, brought about by ultimately a withdrawal of liquidity. That leads me to my third proposition, which is that we don't have the toolkits to be able to um, develop a financial architecture that um, uh, can, can put forward, can operate, can implement good policies. Our toolkits are extremely limited. Um, because they omit a key element of uh, the international financial system. Okay, well, what is our basic standard toolkit? Well, we still use uh, basic models, uh, equilibrium price models. Purchasing power parity is fundamental to everything, where um, you know, time and again we'll make policy judgments based upon an assessment, is this country overvalued or is this exchange rate undervalued? Um, it's, it's, not a very, it's, it's not a very functional toolkit in its own right, but what I'm going to say, not a very functional concept in its own right, but what I'm going to say is that actually concentration upon purchasing power parity, etc., um, actually omits uh, an important part of uh, what we should be looking at. Um, our other, the other part of our toolkit is you know, a basic Mundell Fleming model and things such as the, the uh, impossible trinity. Um, but why do, why do I say that's omitting a lot from, uh, of what actually exists in the international uh, financial system? Um, well, let's just look at uh, foreign exchange markets. You know, what are the transactions on foreign exchange markets that policy is meant to be engaging with, addressing? addressing? Well, transactions on, on foreign exchange markets are huge. Uh, and that leads us to think, well, that's fine, you know, those foreign exchange markets are financing trade. A good thing. Um, in 2013, um, you know, approximately 5 trillion US dollars per day uh, were traded. Um, uh, at the same time, though, trade was minuscule by comparison. Uh, goods and services exports were only 63 billion instead of 5,000 billion. Um, per day. Uh, what's happening to the rest of it? Well, the rest of it obviously is, you know, is, is made up of the, the, the millions of transactions that occur daily um, of portfolio adjustments, some of which are speculative, some of which are built into um, risk minimization uh, portfolios and so on. But they're essentially capital account type transactions between currencies. Um, our, our models uh, don't really engage with them. Now, you could say, well, okay, Mundell Fleming or, 
uh, or uncovered interest parity in the Fisher equation do engage with them because clearly you know they have an equilibrium interest rate in the middle of them. Um, but um, uh, my argument is that actually you know just uh, building models which really take can deal with, uh, capture the capital market simply in terms of um, uh, comparative interest relative interest rates on uh, riskless debt, um, riskless government short term debt. Uh, between countries is totally inadequate for really giving attention to um, those that those vast volume that vast volume of uh, of portfolio transactions daily. Um, so uh, and as a result, you know our policy debates continue to focus upon current account pricing issues, such as focusing upon whether an exchange rate is overvalued or undervalued. Uh, my fourth proposition is that reform plans are always backward looking and that follows the major reform attempt that follows from what I've said because major reform attempts for uh, the financial architecture IFS1 always disappoint because they're inevitably attempts to fight the last war and when you look at the details of any of them they're always looking at the past crisis rather than possibly future ones and that's inevitable it's not simply that people are malign or foolish it's inevitable because um, IFS2 it, uh, the free market etc is driven by financial innovation that leads to over expansion and crises new engineered products uh, shadow banking new market trading systems algorithmic trading etc um, and by its nature by definition innovation cannot be foreseen so in the face of this, um, uh, reform, uh, uh, in the face of this, the sort of regulatory architecture um, of IFS1 is like a drug control agency, you know, continually trying to rein in the market for drugs, but it's always existing drugs, and the drug makers um, are one step ahead. They make new types and so on. Um, okay, so that's a pessimistic view. Um, and uh, I'm sure that you know, many other people uh, in, in these three days will be having lots of optimistic views about the future, and, and that's why I'm here, to gain some cheer and optimism. Um, but, um, so, but let me finish by saying, well, even though I have a pessimistic view, let's try. Well, what would we, what would we need to do if we're going to try and make any, attempt, any serious attempt at, at um, financial architecture reform. The first is to understand and build models of the new developments within the international financial system. Uh, some of those that have already been referred to uh, and others that uh, I, won't bother to, I won't have time to list. Um, the second is that we have to have a universal sovereign bankruptcy system. Um, uh, in, in IFS1, it's not really a system. We have a financial architecture. We don't really have a system. It's not designed uh, as an engineer would design a system. It's grown up as a hodgepodge. And look at things like you know, the Paris Club and, and London Club. You know, they've grown up as sort of very ad hoc kind of institutions and other parts of the architecture as well. And we need to have a, a proper uh, sovereign bankruptcy system to, to um, uh, mitigate uh, the, the effects of crises uh, and to be able to resolve crises. We need to reform credit rating firms' role. I, I like the idea of, of uh, abolishing them, but actually that wouldn't work. Um, and, but there are other ways of, of, uh, of, um, of mitigating the dangers of credit rating firms' uh, current role. Uh, and uh, finally, I, I, I endorse the proposal that Willem Balta made uh, a couple of years ago that we need to increase the role of equity-type fi equity financing uh, throughout the international finance system rather than fixed income financing. Um, such, things as, as, as foreign, uh, such things as sovereign GDP growth bonds. Um, uh, I look forward to the discussion.